Welcome to Anchors of Truth. From the 3 ABN Worship Center, The Final Revolution with Ty Gibson. Well, welcome to West Frankfurt and to our worship center here at Three Angels Broadcasting Network. And we're so glad for those that are here with us live. And we're so happy that you could join us by television. And again, we're live going all around the world uh, tonight with a message by Ty Gibson. And the message is the final revolution. In fact, this entire series is entitled The Final Revolution. And Ty Gibson is giving us part one tonight. Uh, Ty is no stranger to those of you that watch 3ABN. He is one of our best known and one of our favorite speakers uh, on this network. And we have asked him to be the uh, primary, the, pr the first speaker of the year uh, to kick off the new Anchors of Truth series. He is the uh, co-director and uh, founder, co-founder of Light Bearers Ministry. And uh, this ministry has been used by God to reach people all over the world, primarily with the printed word, though they also are very uh, active in presenting uh, the word through preaching. We uh, are so happy to have Ty here. And uh, tonight, before he comes to speak to us, I'm going to ask our friend C.A. Murray to come to pray with us first and then to sing for us that song, No One Ever Cared for Me Like Jesus. Shall we pray? Gracious Father, we do praise you and thank you for another opportunity to lift up the name of Jesus. We do so secure in the knowledge that Christ has said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men, all women, unto myself. And so we ask for, Ty, this night, a holy boldness and a holy unction as he preaches of the things of God. Give us listening and attentive ears and hearts wherever we are, in our cars, at work, at home, wherever we're listening, by computer, internet, however we receive this message, may it be received with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit that we may not be just hearers of the word, but doers thereof. And we thank you for being our honored guest tonight in Jesus' name, amen. In the world, they have songs that are called standards. Usually a standard is a song that's been around a long time, has a particular message, a lot of people sing it, and it has a, uh, a message that sort of resonates with uh, those who sing it and with those who hear. I suspect if we were to list standards in the Christian realm, no one e ever cares for me like Jesus is a, is a standard. I have a very good friend. He's a conference president. He bought a new Oldsmobile in New York oh, about 10 years ago. And after having it only three days, he came downstairs and all four doors were stolen off of his brand new Oldsmobile. And uh, he went upstairs, he played the piano, and for an hour before he called the police, he just played, no one ever cares for me like Jesus. <laughs> and if you've ever been through any trauma or drama in your life, if you've had hard times when perhaps friends and family have deserted you, you know that it is true. It's not just words. No one ever cares for you like Jesus. He is consistent. He's always there. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how he changed my life completely He did something that no other friend could do no one ever cared for me like jesus there's no other friend so kind as 
Thank you, CA. What a blessing. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm glad you've come to study this important subject with me. I'm going to begin our five-part series by sharing with you the story of a little girl named Cammy. Children oftentimes, when they are little, have profound insights, and Cammy's no exception. When she was in the first grade, her teacher gave a pretty exciting assignment. Children like to play show-and-tell, but on this occasion, the show-and-tell was very, very specific. They weren't to bring something from home. The children were to draw a picture of anything they wanted and then show the picture to the class and tell about it. So all the children went to work, busily drawing, and the teacher roamed around the room and came to little Cammie. And she was so devoted to her piece of art that the teacher leaned down and whispered to Akami, that's a very, very interesting piece of art that you're constructing there. What are you drawing? And she said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, Cammy, nobody has ever seen God. You can't draw a picture of God. Nobody knows what he looks like. And Cammy said, why do you think I'm drawing this picture? They're going to know in a minute. (laughs) And that, my friends, is precisely the calling that God has put upon his end-time people. We oftentimes imagine that perhaps the Lord has something else in mind, 
that it might be something more profound, but I believe there's nothing more profound than this. God's people at this end time segment of human history are called to paint a picture of God for the world. Specifically, the character of God. Now, we know, of course, that nobody has ever seen the face of God, just as Cammie's teacher said. But the fact is, we can see his heart. We can probe into the way God thinks and feels, and we can see the way he behaves in history. We can, therefore, begin to understand the kind of person that God is. And when we begin to know him as he really is, things marvelous begin to take place inside of us. We begin to trust him when we know him. And when we trust him, we begin to serve him with an intelligence and a passion that we've never known before. Now, in Scripture, Jesus, right before he left this world, offered a profound insight regarding the problem with the human race, you and myself included. We're in a predicament, and Jesus pinpointed the nature of that predicament. Turn in your Bibles to John 17. And here, Jesus is praying pretty much his last prayer before he leaves this world, before he goes to Calvary and dies. And the apostles are the focus of this prayer. He's praying specifically for his followers in the immediate historic context. But Jesus is also praying for all believers down through history that will follow. He's praying for you, and he's praying for me. Now, we're going to look at this prayer in a very unique way. We're not going to begin at the start and work our way through. I just want to come to the very final words of the prayer. And here we discover that right before Jesus departs from this world, he offers a diagnostic statement if you will, regarding the human race. Notice what he says in verses 24 through 26. Father, he says, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. Now notice this very carefully. He wants you and me, he wants us to be with him for a specific purpose, that they may behold my glory. Now, we're going to discover later on in our time together in this five-part series that when the Bible uses the word glory, it is invoking a large idea. It is everything that pertains to the character of God. The word in the Greek, and we're in the New Testament here, so this is the Greek part of the Bible, the Old Testament being in Hebrew originally. The Greek word is doxa, D-O-X-A, and it just means to radiate outward, to shine, to give some kind of brilliant outshining of radiance. And the concept of glory is that whatever it is, that composes a person's character finds manifestation in the way they interact with people, in the way they behave. So the glory of God is what makes up his heart, his mind, his thoughts, his feelings, his motives, everything that pertains to the character of God manifested or radiating outward in his dealings with humanity. So Jesus says, Father, I want them to be with me. I want them to be with me for a specific purpose. I want them to behold my glory, and we're going to take that to mean I want them to behold my what? Character. I want them to become acquainted with who I am, how I think, how I feel, how I behave, the kind of person that I am. And we're going to see this evening why this is so crucial that we know God for who he really is. Is. So Jesus goes on and he says, I want them to behold my glory, for you loved me, Father, before the foundation of the world. Now Jesus is kind of thinking back to what he was experiencing before he came to our world in the incarnation. And this is a beautiful insight regarding the place Jesus had prior to his time on planet Earth. What was Jesus doing 
before he came to this world? Well, according to the Scripture, he was in some way experientially involved in the love of the Father. Father, you loved me before the foundation of the world, before the world was created, and, of course, before he came to this world incarnate. Jesus was involved in a love relationship with his Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit compose a social unit, a community. One scholar refers to the triune God as a communitarian God. God exists in community, in friendship. And Jesus is thinking back to the time that he shared with the Father before he came to this world. Father, he says, I want them to be with me where I am, where I'm going after my crucifixion, to reunite with you because I want them to be with us as participants in the same quality of love that, Father, you and I had before I even came to this world before the world was even created. I want to bring them in to that relationship. Now, I would submit to you that there is nothing that we as human beings could even begin to imagine that would in any way compare with the glorious future that Jesus is describing here for fallen yet redeemed human beings. Our redemption, our salvation, is not merely about getting us out of trouble with God for our transgressions. Our salvation is God saving us out of sin, but into something. Not just to take us out of a problem, but to safely deliver us into something remarkable and glorious. He's not just trying to take something out of us, namely sin and guilt and shame. He's trying to put something in us to fill the void, to fill the vacancy. And here Jesus pinpoints precisely what that is that God wants to fill our hearts with. Father, I was with you before the foundation of the world. You and I were engaged in a love relationship that was glorious. And Father, I want them to be with me in the future as sharers in that relationship. Then Jesus goes on and he says, now giving the diagnosis of the human predicament. Verse 25, O righteous Father, notice carefully, the world has not what does it say? Yeah. Known you. The world has not known you, Father. There is a void of knowledge, of awareness, of intimacy with God. Jesus goes on to say, the world has not known you, but I have, what? Yeah. Known you. And these, speaking immediately in the immediate context of the disciples, but also speaking of all human beings, Subsequent to this, these have known that you have sent me, now watch this very carefully, and I have declared to them your name, Father, which is another biblical word for character. Throughout Scripture, the word name is synonymous with character. Why? Because names in biblical times, unlike our time, had meaning that signified the character or personality of the child or of the place. For example, Jacob was called Jacob because he had grabbed the heel of Esau as he was exiting the womb, or at least his parents imagined that he tried to pull him back in so he could be the firstborn. And so when Jacob came out of the womb after attempting to be the firstborn, they said, your name's Jacob, which means basically, you little deceiver. How'd you like to have that name affixed to you at birth? But then he prevailed with God later in life, and God said, now I'm going to change your name. You're not Jacob anymore. Now you're Israel. You're Victor. You have prevailed with God, so a name change is in order. Throughout Scripture, every name has character significance. When Jesus says, I came to this world for the specific purpose of declaring the name of the Father, he means, I'm here to disclose the truth about the character of God. I'm here in this world to make known 
who God is. So are you getting the, the sense here that there is a colossal mission that is being launched from this prayer? Jesus says, again, O righteous Father, verse 25, the world has not known you. That's the problem. In the simplest terms possible, Jesus looks at humanity and he says, the problem is they don't know the Father. They are under the impression that they know God, as we'll see in just a moment, because Jesus is speaking in a very religious context. Everybody around him claims to believe in God. And I'll call attention to the fact this evening that the world in which we live in right now with its 7.2 billion people, of those 7.2 billion people, fully 6 billion of them claim to believe in God. Or let's say it this way, claim to believe something about God. And there's the operative word, something about God. Everybody on the planet pretty much has a conception, a picture, a view of God. Even the approximately 1 billion people, about 800 million people, it's approaching 1 billion now claim to be atheists in our world out of the 7 billion. About 1 billion say, no, we don't believe in the existence of God at all. No such being exists. But even the atheists in our world, by and large, are saying, I don't believe in God, by which they mean, what I've been told about God, I reject. The picture that has been portrayed to me, what I was taught to believe about God, I reject. Which leaves us with a glorious evangelistic opportunity because we might conclude and rightly conclude that there are many people who don't believe in God, who might believe in God if they received a picture of God that was rational and attractive and healing and satisfying and beautiful. If God could be repainted on the canvas of human hearts and minds, we might find people we never imagined who now align themselves as enemies of God might say, well, wait a minute, why didn't somebody tell me he was like that? I can believe that. Many people are rejecting a caricature, a picture of God that is anything but true. Jesus gives an assessment of the human problem upon the closure of his ministry. It's coming to an end. He's about to go to the cross, and he says, Father, the problem is they don't know you. But I know you, Jesus says. I know exactly who you are, and I have declared to them your name. Jesus came to this world to set in motion a movement that would disseminate to the world the picture of God, precisely the picture of God, that was represented in himself. Jesus is, the book of Revelation calls him, the true and faithful witness, by which scripture means he is the one that testifies the truth about God. So, continuing on to the closure of his prayer, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and I have declared to them your name, which means what, again? character of God, I have declared, made known to them your name, and will declare it, watch this, so that the love with which you have loved me, Father, may be in them, and I in them. This is one of the mountaintops of Scripture. This is an incredible disclosure for you and me of exactly what the problem is with our world, what the world needs, and what God's ultimate plan is for human beings. He wants you and me and everybody that you have any contact with, anybody you've ever seen, the person that you buy your groceries from and exchange a little bit of laughter as you're departing the grocery store, the person that works in the cubicle next to you, 
the person that you just pass ever so briefly as you're walking on the sidewalk in your town and your eyes just briefly meet. Every single person without exception is in need of knowing the glorious truth of who God is. And there is a sense in which, as we'll discover through this five-part series, that right now the human race is teetering on the tipping point. That is to say, the human race is right there on the razor's edge of going one way or the other regarding the character of God. Our world is filled with people who right now are more ready, more ripe, more curious than ever about who God is. A poll was conducted in a large Western European city, very much like the American situation, becoming increasingly more and more secular here in America, just as Western Europe is secular. And in this city, they just had two questions. They're roaming the streets and they're asking people just two questions. Now watch this. Just walking up and saying to one individual after another, question number one, we're taking a poll. Do you have an interest in religion or church? 90% of the people just said, nope, and walked away. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Those doing the poll stopped them. We do have a second question. A second question. Just one more. Do you have any interest in God? And the numbers switched. 90% of people said, oh, God? Sure, I have an interest in God. God? Curiosity about God? The person? Religion? No. Church? No. God? I'm curious about God. Do you see what's happening there? There's a very interesting dynamic going on socially, emotionally, psychologically in our world today. Down through history, God has, as we're going to learn in this series, God has been grossly misrepresented. Or as one author says, using a word that you will not find in your dictionary, God has been uglified. <laughs> and the uglification of the character of God down through history through religion as we're going to discover, the uglification of God's character, that is the misrepresentation of God's character, has given rise to a violent reaction psychologically and emotionally against God. People have shut him out, not because they know him as he is, but because he has been misrepresented to them. And so many people are eager to know who God really is is and the moment we begin as god's people as his church at this very crucial juncture of history the moment we begin to focus our attention on magnifying the truth about the character of god the identity of god when we begin to talk to people about hey this is the kind of person God is. This is how he thinks. He's also an emotional being. This is how he feels. Every time you ever experience trouble or pain or tragedy in your life, the Bible says that he experiences a resonating pain with you. God is very sensitive. I've talked to people who want nothing to do about God, and they say, but what do you believe in our discussion? And I begin to share with them, I believe that God is, first and foremost, a personal being, not a mass of energy. May the force be with you. God isn't a distant king or judge seated on a throne with outstretched arm and pointed finger and his other finger poised over the zap button to make sure that misery occurs from time to time. The picture of God that has been painted for the world is indeed ugly, and people are reacting against it. But what would happen if God were revealed to the world with irresistible beauty? What if God, to use a very simple illustration, were to get people's attention like a beautiful field of flowers that you can't help but look at? or a beautiful piece of music that you didn't expect to encounter as you're going through some public place and suddenly there's Beethoven's Third Symphony and you're thinking, wow, that's incredible, and you just pause to listen. 
It's spontaneous when beauty is disclosed. Do you hear what I'm saying? Rather than God being framed or communicated in a light that repulses the human heart, God needs to be revealed as he really is, as Jesus revealed him, to be irresistibly attractive. God is beautiful when we know him for who he really is. And when we find ourselves encountering beautiful aspects or dimensions or traits of his character, we find ourselves spontaneously leaning forward, getting more curious, wanting to know this kind of God. And Jesus says when the world begins to encounter a knowledge of God in that kind of light, Jesus makes it very clear that at that point, they will be encountering a God of infinite love who is having no other agenda but to re-induct them into his love. What does he say here again? The world has not known you. That's the assessment. That's the diagnosis. Number two, but I have known you. I know who you are, Father. And I have, number three, declared your character to them. And I'll continue to declare it. That is through the church, down through the ages. And then finally, what does Jesus say? When they know you, Father, they will begin to love you. And they will be brought back in to the inner circle of the love relationship that you and I have had for all eternity past. That's the picture that Jesus paints of the work that needs to be done by the church at this end time segment of human history. Now, having laid that foundation, giving Jesus final words in prayer before he leaves this world pretty much, before he comes to the cross at least, I want you to back up in the Gospel of John now and notice a pattern that develops that will lead us to where we want to be tonight regarding the final revolution of human history that needs to occur. Go all the way back in the Gospel of John to chapter 1, and you're going to notice a pattern here that builds up to what we just read in John chapter 17. First of all, in John chapter 1, Jesus is revealed as the Word, capital W, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What do you think about when you read the word, Word? Communication, maybe? That's what I think of. Words are for the purpose of communicating, right? Jesus has come to this world to communicate. One version says, in the beginning was the voice and the voice was with God, and the voice was God. And the point is that God has been speaking down through history. Before the incarnation, God has been speaking into human hearts all along. I know that that was true for me. Before I encountered any public preaching or Bible study in a formal sense, as I look back now in retrospect, I wonder if this is true about you, as I look back now, I can see that before I had any formal introduction to God, that there were providential leadings, and he was active in my life before I ever knew him. Orchestrating, arranging, putting together situations and encounters with people so that having stimulated desire in my heart for him, that when I hear the word preached, it resonates with what he's already been doing in my heart. And that's going on with people all around you all the time. God is active now with every person on the planet, whispering truth into their consciousness, opening their minds to him. Go down to verse 9. Verse 9, Jesus is called the true light who gives light to how many people? Every person who comes into the world. Are there any exceptions here? No. Jesus has been illuminating the hearts and minds of all men, women, and children down through history preparatory to a living encounter with him. So Jesus comes into the world, according to John chapter 1, for the specific purpose of 
communication. Go down to verse 14 now. And the Word became what? Flesh. And dwelt or tabernacled or lived among us. And we beheld. What does the word beheld indicate? We saw. We encountered. We saw him. We beheld him. And when we beheld him, what did we see? Jesus came into the world and we beheld his glory. What does the word glory mean again? Character. We beheld his character, his glory. But whose glory ultimately is this? The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Notice this. There is a direct linkage. This is important. There is a direct link between who Jesus is and the glory, the character we see in him as his life unfolds and the Father. Everything we see in Jesus is an accurate rendering of the character of the Father. That's the point here. Look now, this is so exciting when you see the connections here. Look now at verse 18. No one has seen who? God at any time. I mentioned that at the open of the message. We haven't seen God's face. Moses at one point said to the Lord, Father, I want God, I want to see you. Show me your glory. And God said, you can't see the face of God and live. No, not, not at this juncture of human history. The sin problem has so damaged the human being that an immediate encounter with God would cause immediate destruction. His glory would destroy us because of the sin problem. So Jesus basically is revealed here as the one, it goes on to say, the one who declares him. Declares who? Verse 18, are you there? No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son. Who's that? Jesus, who is where? In the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So, so Jesus, before his incarnation, existed where precisely according to this text? In the bosom of the Father. What might that mean? In intimate friendship with the Father. Again, it is indicating to us that if anybody knows God, Jesus does. He, before he came to this world, existed in the bosom of the Father. That is, in the heart of the Father, in fellowship with the Father. And so, because he was with the Father... In the bosom of the Father, what has he come to the world to do? Verse 18 again, the last part. He has what? Declared him. So there is declaration. There is communication that we can expect to occur. We can expect this communication to occur in two specific ways. Number one, he's the word. So does Jesus throughout his life leading up to Calvary, does he speak words? Does he teach? Does he preach? Yes or no? Yes, but also, what did it say back in verse 14? We beheld. Not only do we hear, but we what? We see. We see the glory of the Father in living color, personified in Jesus, in action. And when we see that glory, the glory of the Father in Jesus, there are two words in verse 14 that encapsulate the character of God. What are they? Do you see them? He comes to the world full of two things, grace and truth. Isn't that fascinating? One psalm, I think Psalm 85, it may be verse 10, foretells that when the Messiah would come, that mercy and truth in him would kiss each other. Here Jesus comes to the world to reveal the character of God, and the character of God is composed of both grace and truth. What if God were to come to you and me and to the human race as a whole with nothing but undiluted truth, period, end of subject, Jesus just comes to the world to tell it like it is. No grace, no mercy, just the raw data of truth the way we do evangelism sometimes. What if Jesus only came with truth 
we wouldn't be able to bear the revelation. Later on in his ministry, he would say, there are many things I would say to you, but you cannot, do you know? Bear them right now. So Jesus is giving a measured disclosure. He's not using the dump truck approach to evangelism, where you basically just pull up to any willing victim and pull the lever and dump everything you know on them. <laughs> Jesus is revealing the truth incrementally, paying attention to the emotional and psychological capacity of those that he's interacting with. And Jesus comes not merely with truth, but yes, with truth, coupled with what? Grace, mercy. I'm going to tell you the truth about yourself and about the Father, and you'll feel that painful contrast between his righteousness and your sinfulness. But I want you to know something. I want you to know something, Jesus says. I'm going to give you the truth, but every step of the way, I'm going to lavish my grace upon you. I'm going to not only tell you the truth, I'm going to forgive and exercise mercy and compassion every step of the way so that you can process the truth. So we encounter the glory of God in two forms, in Christ, in Jesus, in word and in deed. We hear the preaching of the gospel, but what gives the gospel its validity and what gives the gospel credibility? It's the life of the Savior. He loves people as he interacts with them. And because he loves them, they can bear the truth he has to speak to them. And as Jesus unfolds his ministry, we are receiving a living model of how the gospel is to be proclaimed straight on down to the end of time. Notice chapter 5 now and verse 19, continuing this theme. John chapter 5, verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing, what does Jesus say? Of himself. But what he sees, the Father do. For whatever he, that is the Father, does, the Son also does in like manner. What is Jesus saying here? As you encounter me, you are encountering the Father. I'm the Son, and everything that I'm doing, all my interactions with you and with everybody else, as my life unfolds before you, right up to the apex revelation of God's glorious character at the cross, every step of the way, what is Jesus saying here? I'm doing what I see in the Father. I'm acting out what I know to be the truth about the character of God. And as we're going to discover, this is a law of human nature and human experience. Finally, we're going to discover that the great controversy reaches forward to the final events of human history disclosed in Revelation 13 and 14. And when that final crisis occurs, if you want to summarize what Bible prophecy is basically telling us, it is this, that ultimately there will be a convergence of events and pressures socially, politically, and religiously that will prompt every human being to act out their picture of God. Ultimately, all of us will disclose what we really believe about the Father in the way we deal with others every day and finally in that climactic crisis of human history. Everybody acts out their picture of God. Whatever you believe, about God's dealings with you will come out in the way you deal with others. Jesus is articulating that principle. I do nothing of myself, he says. Whatever I see the Father doing, the Son does in like manner. I am like he is, he is like I am. We are one in character, and your encounter with me is an encounter with the character of the Father. That's John 5, 19. Now skip over to chapter 8. So here we have an example of Jesus 
living out the character of God, living out and mirroring the character of the Father in his dealings with the woman caught in adultery. As we said in chapter 1 of John, there are two ways in which the character of God is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. In his speaking, preaching, in his words, and in his life, in his way of relating to people. And here we see Jesus putting on display a remarkable revelation of the character of God. This woman was caught, the scripture says in John chapter 8, in the very act of adultery. There was no question whatsoever of her guilt. She was, in fact, caught in the act. She was guilty. In fact, you get the impression that she was set up in order to put Jesus to the test. And as this woman is thrown before Jesus, he interacts with those who are accusing her, who, by the way, and this becomes crucial in our understanding here, are the religious leaders of the time. These aren't secular people. These aren't atheists. These aren't unbelievers who are perpetrating this act upon this woman. These are the quote-unquote people of God. These are the religious leaders of the time. They bring the woman to Jesus, and they basically say... We're looking for a verdict of condemnation. She needs to be stoned. Moses says so. They're giving, of course, their own interpretation of the larger scope and context of what that system of the Old Testament was really all about, tending toward Christ. But here's the point. In this immediate context, they want a verdict of what? Condemnation. But Jesus deals with them in a very creative way by writing with his finger in the dust of the marble of the temple floor in the courtyard. And one by one, beginning with the oldest down to the youngest, all of these accusers depart. Jesus is left alone with the woman. Now watch this. And he asks a question. Woman, verse 10 where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Now notice the irony here. She's heard the rumors that this is the Christ, this is the Messiah, this is the Son of God, at least that's what some are saying. So she knows that she is having an encounter with a religious personage of some kind. She may even believe at this point that sure enough, he may be the Messiah. We don't know at this point in the story whether she believes that or not, but she's heard the rumors. And if God, here's the key, is rightly represented in the religious leaders of the time, then what is she expecting from Jesus? More of the same. More accusation. More condemnation. But Jesus poses a question. Where are your accusers... Does anyone condemn you? And she says, no man, Lord. Nobody's accusing me. No condemnation. It's gone. They've all left. And now what's hanging in the air? What's coming next from you? And what does he deal out to her? A glorious, beautiful revelation of the love of God in the form of mercy. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. We don't have time to get into this here, but Jesus has given the formula there of what I like to refer to as the moral dynamic of the gospel. The moral dynamic of the gospel is that all future victory over sin is predicated upon the forgiveness and mercy and love of God. Precisely to the degree that I understand God's forgiving mercy will I be morally empowered to go and sin no more. I am incapable of victory over sin except as I live in the immediate conscious context of God's pardoning love. That's where the power resides. But then, verse 12, this is where we wanted to get. Then Jesus spoke to them again. You can imagine that there are people standing around watching this whole thing unfold. They've seen the character of God purportedly represented in the religious leaders, and now they have seen by contrast what? Another picture. Both are making a claim. What are the religious leaders 
unspokenly, in a direct sense, what are they making claim to? We represent God. She needs to be condemned and stoned. Jesus is making a similar claim by his actions. No, I represent God, and I forgive you. So two pictures are before the people here. And Jesus then, after he forgives the woman and morally empowers her by his forgiveness, he says in verse 12, Jesus spoke to them, the people standing around, saying, I am the what? I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in what? In darkness, but shall have the light of life. What just happened there? Contextually, Jesus, listen carefully now, has just identified, specifically identified, his forgiveness, mercy, his pardoning love in his interaction with this woman as the light of the world. <laughs> the light the world needs to encounter. Jesus forgives her. He restores her innocence by pardoning her of her sin. He empowers her with that pardoning love. And then he turns to the people around and he says, you just saw the light. You just saw the light of the world shining with brilliance upon your minds. And I hope you got it as it was flashing by because you just saw God in this act of mercy. Wow. Jesus has just identified himself as the true representation of the character of God. So verse 13 isn't surprising. The Pharisees, therefore, it seems that some of them have now returned to hear this declaration. They're processing all of this. The Pharisees, therefore, said to him, you bear witness of yourself, and your witness is not true. What have they just said? You're a, liar. You're a liar. You claim that how you just dealt with this woman is the true light that reveals the character of God, and we reject it. No, that's not what God is like. You're a liar. Your witness, that is, your testimony of the character of God is a false representation of the character of God. Do you see what's happening here? They are rejecting the true light of God's character as it is shining upon their minds. Well, the chapter unfolds with an interaction, a rather long interaction all the way to the close of the chapter. The Pharisees proceed to say, we're the ones who rightly represent God. We're the true witnesses, not you. And Jesus begins to say to them, he says, listen, my witness is accurate. I know the Father. He sent me. And the way I interacted with that woman is the truth about God. That's his testimony. No, 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 they say, we represent God. And then Jesus says, look now, this is remarkable, in verses 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, those who were beginning to see the light, if you abide in my word, what's the context here? You've got to get the contextual flow. Are there two words that are being spoken? Are there two theologies that are being presented? Yes or no? Yeah, there is a clash of doctrinal insight here. Doctrinal knowledge, doctrinal representation. Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. Verse 32 is crucial. And you shall know what? the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It'll liberate you. Contextually, what's the truth that Jesus is referring to here in the singular? Not truths as in a list of theological points. Singular. You shall know the truth. Singular. What is the truth contextually? It is the truth about the character of God that has been accurately rendered in Jesus as he interacts with people, specifically with this woman. You shall know the truth, the truth of the radiant glory of the character of God manifested in the forgiveness that I just showered upon her heart with which I empowered her to overcome this thing that was destroying her. You shall know the truth and the truth will liberate you. The truth of God's love 
is the liberating factor of the gospel. That's what Jesus is saying here. Well, then these Pharisees, the Pharisees who are disputing, not the believing ones, begin to argue with him. Hey, hey, we have the truth. Abraham is our father. We know our lineage. And Jesus says, listen, if Abraham were your father, that is spiritually, yeah, you got the biological lineage going on. That's fine. But spiritually, if you really were children in the spiritual lineage of Abraham, you would love me. You would know that I am telling the truth about the Father. And then Jesus says something remarkable to them. He says, uh, you claim to worship God? The fact is, he says, your father is the devil. But you've done something terribly deceptive by putting the character of Satan in the place of the character of God. In other words, he, he tells them, you have installed a false theological paradigm and transposed God's name over it. You are attributing things to God that are not true of him. But Jesus says, I have the true testimony of what God is really like. And his ministry then continues to unfold up to that closing prayer where Jesus says, Father, now you can see the context, right? Father, the world does not, what again? Know you, but I know you. And I've come to this world for the single purpose of making your character known. Everything hinges, my friends, on the picture we hold in our hearts of the character of God. The call that we have as a people is to do what Cami did, to draw, as it were, to paint, as it were, a picture of God so that the world can know what he's really like. That is the revolutionary light that will cause the world in which we live in to be illuminated with the glory of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are truly incredible. The light of your glory manifested in Jesus.